manuscript came into the New York offices of the International News Service without fanfare in early November 1942. It had uh, made uh, quite a, a trip. The pages had been transported from the U.S. Navy Fleet Headquarters at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, via airmail from a young reporter, just 26 years old, uh, Richard Tregascus. For the previous two months, he had been in the Southwest Pacific on a little-known island in the Solomons named Guadalcanal, codenamed Cactus. He had landed on the island with the approximately 11,000 men of the 1st Marine Division, who stormed the beaches there on August 7, 1942. This marked America's first use of ground troops in a major offensive against the Japanese Empire. His dedication to his job during his time on the canal, as the Marines came to call the island, impressed their commander, uh, General Alexander Vandergriff. Here's uh, Tregascus with Vandergriff. Shortly before he left the island in late September, uh, Tregascus at least, and one of the reasons he left, or a couple of reasons, one, he wanted to get back and write his book, uh, which I'll talk about, uh, we're talking about now, but also because he had uh, had to change from his record combat shoes until these tennis shoes. He'd been traipsing through the jungle so much that the old pair wore out, and this was the only thing he could find to wear. He went to the quartermaster and asked if he had any size 14 combat boots. Yeah. And the guy threw up his hands in horror and said, no way we're going to do that. So these are not the kind of shoes you're going to wear if you're going to traipse through the tough jungles of Guadalcanal. So that's another reason why he tried to decide to head home. Well, the Marines commander uh, remembered that Tricasa seemed to be everywhere on the island. And the information that he acquired was uh, factual and not what he called a canned handout. Vandergriff especially remembered that during the height of the fighting for what came to be known as the Battle for Edson's Ridge, he could hear through the darkness the sound of someone tapping away at a typewriter. I asked who could be writing at this time when he could not possibly see uh, the paper he was writing on, said the general. And uh, Dick spoke up. He said, it's me, general. I want to get this down while I'm still able. Uh, don't worry about me seeing. I'm using the touch system. <laughs> That's his dedication to his job. On November 6th, Barry Ferris, uh, that's Barry, the uh, shorter gentleman there uh, on the right in the glasses, who was an INS editor, uh, wrote his reporter that the, his manuscript, uh, with information so secret that military censors in the U.S. Navy offices at Pearl Harbor had locked away his notebooks and his big black diary in a safe every night after he finished working on the manuscript during the day, had finally arrived at the New York office. Ferris then turned the manuscript over to Ward Green, who was executive editor of King Features, which was owned and operated as was INS by newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. Ferris wrote that Green would make every attempt to get Tregascus' work accepted by a publisher and then also serialized in uh, national magazines. I did not have a chance to read it thoroughly as I would have liked, Ferris informed Tregascus, who would be splitting proceeds from the book 50-50 with his employer. Uh, but from what I did see, I think you did a magnificent job on it. One person who did take the time to read the manuscript thoroughly was this gentleman, Bennett Serp, who was co-founder of the New York publishing firm Random, Random House. Green had distributed copies of Tregasis' manuscript to nine New York publishers and asked them to bid on the opportunity to publish it, a method that had never been done before, according to Cerf. Just the day before he got Tregasis' manuscript, Cerf had been talking with some of his friends and said that the first book that came out about Guadalcanal would be a knockout because Guadalcanal marked the turning of the tide in the war in the Pacific, which had been going very badly, of course, for the American cause since the Japanese bombed the American fleet at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. As Serv noted, the dictators were ready, and the liberty-loving people were caught totally unprepared. Serf received uh, the manuscript from King Features on November 11th, took it home with him and uh, stayed up all night reading it from front to back 
and called Green at 9 the next morning and told him, I've got to have this book. Please, sir, related years later, that Random House had signed up to publish the young reporter's work before any of the eight other publishers had even had a chance to, to read it completely. His premonition that the American public would be interested in learning more about the Marines and their pitched battles with the enemy on a remote island thousands of miles away turned out to be right on the nose. Rushed into print on January 18, 1943, Guadalcanal Diary became a national bestseller and also the first Random House book to sell more than 100,000 copies. Critic John Chamberlain of the New York Times wrote that Tricassus's book served as a sort of a tonic for the war weary on the home front, showing as it did to the Japanese and those who doubted America's resolve that a country doesn't necessarily have to love war in order to fight it. And like a lot of war books, this was turned into a movie of the same name, which uh, came out from November 1943 from 20th Century Fox. And uh, I've uh, been able to watch it a couple times because it's available on Amazon Prime if you want to uh, take a look at it. It stars uh, William Bendix, Lloyd Nolan, and uh, Anthony Quinn. And uh, there's a young actor named William Jackal, you might remember from a lot of TV roles, and this is really first starring role. He does a great job as a, as a young Marine who everyone else kind of uh, protects during their time on Guadalcanal. Although an unknown in the publishing world, Trugascus had already made a name for himself with his employers at INS and other war correspondents who had followed America's forces into battle during the early desperate days of fighting in the Pacific. Before he landed on Guadalcanal, Tregascus had been on the scene on a nearby USS cruiser and written dispatches about the main turning points for the American Navy, including uh, the uh, famous Doolittle Raid, where our Army bombers took off from the USS Hornet, went off uh, to bomb Tokyo on April 18, 1942, in this uh, very, very top secret mission. So top secret, in fact, that when the reporters who had accompanied the task force with the Doolittle Raiders came back to Hawaii, that their dispatches were frozen. They couldn't send them off for a whole year. So all of uh, Tregaskitz's writings about the Doolittle Raid and what he saw from the cruiser uh, did not appear until a, a year after the actual event. And by that time, he had become famous because of Guadalcanal Diary. So his subsequent uh, dispatches that were uh, uh, featured in American newspapers were under the uh, column title, um, what was it, Doolittle Diary. So kind of went in with Guadalcanal Diary. After the Doolittle raid, Tregascus had boarded the Hornet and remained with the carrier's officers and enlisted men as they attempted but missed out about joining in on the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942. He remained on the carrier for its nest foray into the Pacific and saw, it take, saw its planes take off from its wooden flight deck to seek further revenge for Pearl Harbor against the Japanese carriers at the critical turning point, the Battle of Midway, which turned out to be a smashing victory for the U.S. fleet. In his day-to-day -day interactions with the ship's crew during routine operations and also under fire, he came to learn more about their attitudes about war and death, which he discovered were very sane and matter of fact. Uh, after all, each man might have his life ended any day while they're at sea, either in combat <clears throat> or just through daily, day-to-day -day operations and routine accidents. I had seen some of our flyers virtually drunk with excitement immediately after their first experience in the maelstrom of actual combat, he wrote. But I was to find that such oft-repeated matters as being locked below decks while there was action above, or sailing through waters thick with submarines, or witnessing accidents, or losing one's best friend in battle, can become routine when repeated often enough. After Midway, here are some of the uh, Donald's dive bombers from the Hornet uh, searching for the uh, Japanese uh, fleet. After Midway, in which action a number of Hornet pilots had been killed, 
including every member of Torpedo Squadron 8 that was on uh, the Hornet. This is Torpedo Squadron 8, a picture before uh, they uh, participated in the battle. And just one man, uh, this man in circle here, Ensign George Gay, survived the attack on, on the Japanese carriers. He was shot down, picked up after floating in sea, and he had a first-hand seat at the Battle of Midway while he's floating in the Pacific. Trigascus has been startled when gathered for dinner after the battle that nobody mentioned the empty chairs uh, at the table, and he said they kind of resembled tombstones, all the, the backs of the empty chairs as he, he ate dinner. Instead, uh, the conversation revolved around the usual unimportant matters, but when I reflected about this, I could see that silence was perhaps the most sensible approach. Covering the Doolittle Raid represented an impressive achievement for an inexperienced war correspondent hired by the INS shortly before the attack on Pearl Harbor. He had also just learned from his doctor that he suffered from diabetes which was a family illness. His grandfather had it and his father had it as well. He had also been uh, turned down uh, for service uh, in the war. While he was working on the late shift at the rewrite desk at INS's New York office, he had become so despondent about not being able to contribute to the war effort that he even uh, contemplated taking his life. He rallied, however, and excitedly took to his assignment as an INS war correspondent assigned to cover the Pacific Fleet operations. He'd actually been given two choices by uh, Barry Ferris. He said, do you want to go to England or Australia? He picked Australia, uh, but since all the activity was going on out of Hawaii, INS decided to keep him there, and he would follow the fleet as it went off into action against the Japanese. After all, Tregascus reflected, the closer he came to getting killed in this career, the better my story would be, at least if he survived. That <laughs> he was born on uh, November 28, 1916, and that's an important date because that's also my birthday, November 28. <laughs> so it seemed almost faded that I write his biography. <laughs> he was, uh, grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, the second child and the first son of Archibald and maid M. Osterman Tregascus. That's his sister Madeline with him in their uh, backyard garden. Uh, Maud family came from Germany and had included a long line of scholars and teachers. And she said that both of her children were excellent students and stood at the head of their classes each month with very few exceptions. Archibald, who was originally from Cornwall, England, made his living as the head of the editorial department for the Singer Manufacturing Company which, of course, made Singer sewing machines at a factory outside of town. As a young boy, Tregascus had been a keen reader, drawn, he said, to many warlike sagas of the past, including reading about King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, Spain's legendary El Cid, and the Scandinavian hero Beowulf. All of these characters, he said, were brave men at war for ideals in the past. And as a schoolboy, he was always bigger than the others of his age, and he had resented and done battle with the bullies who had picked on the smaller boys at his schools. His interest in journalism started at an early age, at the age of 15. He attended two private schools in the area, the Petty and the Pingree schools, and uh, helped his, his parents, who were strapped for cash because of the effects of the Great Depression, and uh, Archibald's poor health due to his own diabetes. Uh, by paying for his education through earning academic scholarships, working as a student waiter at these schools, and also writing short articles about sports and other school activities for a variety of newspapers, including some in New York, uh, Newark and Trenton, New Jersey, and also Philadelphia. He got more of his articles into print and therefore made some extra money by using various uh, fake names uh, in addition to his own name. So he's a very smart young boy. <laughs> he received scholarships from such groups as the Harvard Club of New Jersey, and uh, he was able to accept admission into the freshman class at Harvard University in 1934. Uh, one of his favorite hobbies uh, growing up was swimming. Of course, he was very close to the Atlantic Ocean, 
and loved swimming for long distances uh, in the ocean. So he became a very accomplished swimmer. And so when he went to Harvard, he decided that he wanted to join his very highly ranked uh, swim team. And he was, uh, I think it was junior year, and he was trying to win the last backstroking spot on the team. And there was a young freshman who was also competing for that spot, and they had a match race. And he, Tregascus, won the race, and he defeated the young man whose name was John Kennedy. <laughs> and of course, uh, Kennedy um, used his swimming schools later to good effect in World War II when his PT-109 was cut in half by a Japanese destroyer and he had to swim to a nearby island towing some of his crewmen who were hurt uh, and saving the, their lives. And uh, later, uh, Tregascus was able to write about Kennedy's exploits in World War II, uh, a book for younger readers about PT-109 and kind of kidded him about beating him uh, for that last spot on the team. Although he said that uh, even though he won a spot on the team, he was not one of the better swimmers. <laughs> Dragaskis studied English literature, history, government, and economics while he was at Harvard. Uh, with an eye toward a career in journalism after he graduated, he believed that possessing this broad sweep of information uh, was important for a writer, uh, more so than in any other profession. He said that a nonfiction writer especially should know something about almost every subject because his article assignments may carry him into many highly specialized fields. And without a basic knowledge, he's apt to be sorely handicapped in his research. I think that came to pass for him as a freelancer after the war. After he graduated from uh, Harvard in June 1938, he got a job in journalism as a reporter for the Boston Advertiser. His schedule at the newspaper included four days of writing feature articles and a double day of news reporting and rewrite. Uh, I covered all the beats, including the waterfront, state house, federal building, police headquarters, and the courthouse, he recalled. In early 1941, he got a job with the International News Service. Now, the INS was not America's journalism's preferred wire service, running often a poor third to the top two. And when you talk about wire services, you had Associated Press at the top, and then United Press was number two, and lagging far behind was INS. Although it was scorned and often badmouthed by both, a uh, longtime INS reporter and syndicated columnist Bob Considine said that we were some of the proudest people in all news business. They were proud, he said, despite being outmanned by the other wire services when it came to covering a story. For example, the INS for World War II for the whole China-Burma-India theater had one person reporting on that wide swath of, of region. And often for when a major news story broke, the AP could send out, for example, 12 men to cover the story. Uh, UPI could send four or five. And the INS just could just send one. So they were always number three, but tried hard. Tregascus um, was ready, willing, and able when called upon by the INS to serve overseas in the Pacific. He stood about six feet five inches in height. And this is one of the intriguing aspects about doing the research for a book. Uh, when I was looking into his life and various uh, feature articles about him, everyone in the team had a different height for Tregascus. <laughs> some had six foot seven, some all the way up to six foot nine, six foot ten. And so it's, you know, an impossible task for a biographer. So I went by his official War Department accreditation card, which listed him at six feet five inches. So that's what I went with in the book. Because he was so tall, his friends joked with him uh, that before going into action against the Japanese, that if they did not kill him, they would capture him and use him as an observation post. <laughs> but he left Guadalcanal relatively unscathed, except for some stomach problems. He had to be hospitalized while he was there for a brief time. And then later he developed malaria after uh, leaving Guadalcanal. He considered himself to be an un unlikely type to be a war correspondent because of his height, his thin frame, and his poor eyesight. 
but he said that he risked his life out of a double sense of duty, uh, duty to his country and to the men who were fighting on his behalf. He was also driven by an insatiable curiosity to uncover the stories of those who experienced combat. And he was able to always seem to be able to find that one person who was probably uh, the uh, toughest fighter among all the people. Like on Guadalcanal, he really allied himself with a lieutenant colonel named uh, Merritt Red Mike Edson, who was the commander of the 1st Raider Battalion, and went on many operations with the Raiders and was kind of adopted by them as almost a mascot, a good luck mascot for their operations. His willingness to go where the action was and to risk his life impressed everyone he met, including one soldier who said to him, how you guys go ahead and stick your necks out when you don't have to? Well, it just beats the hell out of me. And uh, Tregascus had an answer. He said, but we certainly have to. You know, that's our job. His luck finally ran out when he was accompanying Allied forces during the invasion of Italy. After Guadalcanal and the success there, he returned to the United States, uh, went overseas, and uh, quickly went and covered the invasions of Sicily and from there uh, went on to the invasion of Italy. But on November 22nd, 1943, after observing U.S. Rangers battling Germans on Mount Corno near Casino, Italy, he was returning to headquarters to write his story uh, when a German shell landed near him. A shrapnel stuck and pierced his helmet, as you can see here, lodging in his brain and causing a partial paralysis that robbed him for a time of his power to speak, read, and, and to write. Uh, they carried me out with a hole in my skull the size of a soup spoon and bone and steel fragments embedded two inches deep in my brain, he recalled. I worked my way toward the States through six Army and Navy hospitals. Finally, a metal plate was put in my head at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., and after that, he went back to the fighting front. Before doing so, he received a Purple Heart from the military and also uh, produced a second book, Invasion Diary, which detailed his time covering the invasions of Sicily and Italy and his near-death experience at Mount Corno and also his torturous recovery. He also got one of the greatest honors you could get if you were serving in uh, Italy during that time. Ernie Pyle actually went out and wrote a column about Tregascus, one of his uh, fellow colleagues. And if you had an article written about you by Ernie Powell during World War II, if you were a soldier, it was almost as good as winning a medal for valor. Uh, there's a famous cartoon in Yank Magazine, uh, which was produced by and for enlisted men in the service. And it's a, a soldier with his head and his, his arm covering his head. He's like, you can see he's crying, and there's like a newspaper article spilling out of an envelope he's holding. And two other soldiers are observing this, and they said, you know, the caption is, Ernie Pyle misspelled his name. <laughs> that shows how important Pyle was. <laughs> now, throughout all this time, uh, torturous uh, recovery process, Tregassus kept his sense of humor. When a friend visited him at Walter Reed in Washington, Tregassus asked him to do him a favor. Well, sure, anything, the friend responded. Uh, so Tregassus said, before they put the metal plate on, take a look inside my head and see if my brain is still there. <laughs> the friend obliged and confirmed that the brain, where it, sh it, where it sh was, should be, fine, said a relief Tregascus, I might have to use it someday. <laughs> he also joked with the doctors that were performing his operation, asking them if, uh, because he had a metal plate in his head, that he was finally bulletproof, but it was not. <laughs> Uh, recovered Tregascus caught up with American forces in the summer of 1944 after the successful breakout from the Normandy beachhead. He noticed a change in his attitude after almost being killed. I was aware of a new and dreadful sensitivity to the dangers of war, an acute nervous state that made the sounds of incoming shells or enemy machine gun fire crushing and unbearable. His nerves continued to be what he called shaky as he made his way across France, Belgium, Holland, 
and finally into Nazi Germany itself. He decided to put himself to the test by participating in the battle for Aachen, Aachen, Germany, uh, alongside a frontline unit. If he survived, he knew he would be equipped with a new set of nerves and probably a good story, too. He immersed himself into a perilous form of warfare, street fighting, a task he described in the article for the Saturday Evening Post as the bitter, exasperating, block by block and house by house struggle, which develops when war sweeps through thickly settled communities and the enemy is determined to make a fight of it. And as you can see, it's a very destructive form of warfare and a very dangerous as well. He could not get Aachen and what he experienced there out of his mind when he went back to the United States. And he was seized with a fever to write something about the battle. And in a couple of months of frenzied work, produced a novel called Stronger Than Fear. His previous two books had been nonfiction accounts of the war, and this is a fictional account. He had dedicated it to the valor of the infantry, the soldiers without armor, who are the vanguard of every attack. And the book details the experiences of a captain named Paul Kreider, who fought his own battle with fear during intense fighting in a city that Tregaskis named Unterbach, which is kind of a stand-in for what Aachen was to him. Tregaskis could have remained safe at home, back on the home front. Of course, he had done a lot on behalf of the war effort. But editors of a national magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, ask him to go back to the Pacific. They wanted him to get with a, a new crew of uh, one of the new bombers that had been developed to take the fight to the Japanese home islands, the B-29 Super Fortress, to follow them from you know, picking up the plane in the United States, flying it overseas to eventually to Guam, and then going on them with, for bombing missions against the Japanese islands. He was asked by an editor at the Post, do you really want to go? And without hesitating, Turgaskis gave an answer I think any war correspondent uh, would give. He said, you know, I don't want to go, but I think I ought to go. So he went with the crew. Turgaskis was one of the uh, 1,800 men and women who worked as a combat reporter during World War II. And it's a job that he once described as an outsider, but with special privileges. If you were a war correspondent during World War II and accredited by the War Department, you were given officer status, captain, so you had access to uh, officer privileges, including you know, officer clubs and PX privileges. The Army would uh, take you, give you transportation to the battlefronts. Of course, you had to submit everything uh, to uh, censors if, before sending it back home uh, to the United States. And Tregaskis was someone in his entire career as a correspondent, never sent home a, a rewrite of headquarters communique. He didn't want to be a communique commando, as they were called. And these were reporters who stayed safe behind the lines at headquarters and depended on canned handouts from public relations officers. You know, he had to go to and see for himself what was going on with combat. He knew from personal experiences which of his colleagues would not be content with merely taking information from the military headquarters safe behind the lines. To make their dispatches as accurate as possible, they would make those fatiguing trips up to the various division headquarters and into progressively smaller units to regiments and battalions and even companies each step along the way becoming increasingly dangerous, yet more productive of actually getting the real facts uh, as the distance from the enemy uh, diminished. Uh, reporters at war needed to possess with, uh, the guts to write about what they uncovered honestly, even with the constant demand from their editors for sensational uh, headlines about the front. The best correspondence he added stuck to the facts even when it hurt, when a less principled rival might twist the story into a fake to make it a so-called better story. He had often pondered about why he and others risked their lives uh, to report on the war. 
good correspondents like other people of action uh, were generally unwilling to make themselves heroes, he said, but most will admit that they take chances in war zones for the same reason that the mountain climber gave when asked why he wanted to scale Mount Everest, because it's there. Although AP reporter Hal Boyle joked that all he needed to be a war correspondent was a strong stomach, a weak mind, and uh, plenty of endurance, he and his colleagues were aware of the dangers that they faced every day. Uh, despite the death and disabilities that went hand in hand with being involved in war, he said there was another facet that drew people, uh, whatever their personal persuasion or sex. Tricaska said it was the instant elimination of personal ambition in favor of unselfish sacrifice to a greater cause. But he did acknowledge that, you know, war can be as exciting as anything in life. After the war ended, Tregasis worked for a time as a screenwriter for Hollywood films and also later for television programs. He also served as a roving worldwide reporter uh, for True Magazine, which was a magazine for men in the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, his wanderlust did cost him a couple of marriages. Uh, his uh, first wife, Mary, divorced him, said that he was never at home and he was more interested in going out and reporting than uh, dealing with, with their marriage. The second marriage also failed. But um, he finally found happiness with his third wife, Moana Tregaskis, who uh, followed with him on his travels, serving as uh, his photographer on uh, many trips into South Vietnam in the early 1960s. And uh, Moana was very helpful to me when I was writing uh, my book about her, her late husband. Uh, and uh, luckily, she died in this uh, last December, uh, December in 2021. Uh, just a few weeks after my book came out, but she was able to have she hold the book and see it uh, before she died, which I was very happy about. So they went on many trips to South Vietnam during the 1960s, and Trigaskis produced another book, this one called Vietnam Diary, to follow, of course, uh, Guadalcanal Diary and Invasion Diary. And before his death at age 56 from a heart attack, while swimming in the Pacific Ocean on August 13, 1973, he had the opportunity to return to the island that had made him famous, Guadalcanal. He roamed the battle sites on the island, and he saw that the jungle appeared to be always the same. And he swiped at the tangled green mass unearthed, rusting war machinery, uh, everything from airline parts to spent ammunition, as well as the remains of the men who fought there, including bleached white skulls. But uh, to Tregascus, it did not matter if the jungle continued to engulf the foxholes and shells and rusting guns and tanks. It doesn't matter if the jungle looks as savagely pristine as it did before, just so long as the same vigor and guts and bottomless springs of ingenuity, devotion, and humor uh, continue to characterize our fighting happy to answer any questions you have about uh, Tregascus uh, and his uh, career in World War II and later on in Vietnam. No bar What do you have? Well, I found this, I had a chance to read the book, and I found this so fascinating Ray touched on that he, um, he suffered from diabetes. So uh, Ray, share with what he did to, for edibles to survive with his condition. Well, although insulin was available at this time, uh, his doctor advised Tregascus to follow a strict diet to control his diabetes and his blood sugar. So it got, you know, no high carbohydrate foods, uh, lean meat, and a diet of fruits and vegetables. Well, that's hard to find uh, in combat, and especially on Navy ships at that time. So on his very first assignment with the Pacific Fleet, when he went off with the task force for the Doolittle Raid, uh, his fellow correspondents were a little uh, questioned. That he was carrying along with him 100 tins of sardines uh, to uh, kind of supplement his diet. And he also carried with him a handbook uh, developed by uh, a famous uh, doctor who was uh, concerned with diabetes uh, that he uh, faked an inscription from this doctor saying, to my good friend Richard Tregascus, Dr. Joslin, uh, with you know, warm regards. And he said that he claimed he did this because 
if someone questioned why he had this book, well, do you have diabetes? No. He kept all of this a secret during the time. He could say that, no, oh, this guy's just a friend of mine, so I, I take care of it out of a personal connection with him. And really didn't, people didn't really know he had diabetes and suffered from it until after his wounding in Italy. Uh, I think I, the only way I could find was the fact that Ernie Pyle mentioned it in his column about Tregastus because he had to let the doctors know who were doing his operation uh, that he suffered from this, uh, this malady, uh, so, that, so they knew while they were uh, trying to fix his uh, head wound. Uh, so that's when it first came out. But uh, he had kept the secret from a lot of people uh, up to that time. Yeah? What were the years that he served in Vietnam? We're talking about uh, the early days of American involvement, like the early 60s, 62, 63, although he went back continued to go back uh, until his, his death. Uh, he was a prom, strong proponent of American involvement, thought we should you know, try to help South Vietnamese in their battle against the communists. And he had some run-ins with some of the younger correspondents during those early days, in the early 1960s. Uh, this is kind of a clash of generations. You know, in this World War II generation who's used to a certain kind of war, and these younger correspondents you know, are used to this new guerrilla type of operation where there were no fixed battle lines, there was no fixed front. You could be injured if you were accompanying Sabe and these troops in the countryside, or even just having a drink of coffee at a uh, cafe in Saigon. Some BC guerrilla could throw a grenade in and you could in get injured that way. So. Uh, maybe this will trigger something humorous. Uh, a short story, I had a cousin that uh, served as a submarine in uh, Manila Harbor in World War II, and my father wrote him a, a, a letter every Sunday night that he was there. And when he came home, the first person he looked up was my dad, and he said that he had gotten three months letters at one time because they were in the harbor, and then he got five months letters and whatnot. But he was the first person that he looked up and he walked into our house with a suitcase. And guess what was in the suitcase? This is humorous. Lucky Strike cigarettes. The whole suitcase. He bought them at the PX for two cents a pack. Of course, those damn cigarettes killed my dad. But he's given my dad all the Lucky Strikes that, that he wants at two cents. And then he signed up for the Navy. The Pearl Harbor was December the 7th. I think three days later, he and his best friend signed up. His best friend became an admiral in the Navy, and my my cousin was just a seaman, first class, whatever, on the, on the submarine. But what humorous story do you know? I mean, I've enjoyed your presentation. It's very factual, and you yeah. obviously know so much about it. So is there anything really funny that struck you? I thought that. One of the funny stories that he uh, writes in Guadalcanal Diary is the fact that, uh, of course, the Marines were under siege early on. Uh, there had been this big naval battle after they landed, and the carriers had left, a lot of the transports had left, and without all the heavy equipment they might need to, for example, barbed wire was left overseas, a lot of their uh, uh, heavy guns that might have you know, knocked out the Tokyo Express as it ran by the slot and bombed the Marines on shot every night. Uh, they bombarded uh, the Marines. And uh, there was a funny story about uh, they're undergoing a bombardment at night, and he and this uh, Marine officer are running for the, uh, uh, their bunker. And they get to the entrance, and one goes, oh, after you. No, no, after you. And they're out while shells are landing all around, and they're having this, you know, no, no, you go first, you go first. He found it kind of funny that they kept up this pretense of a civilization in combat. Uh, just a statement. Uh, our uncle, and I hope this is extensive in the book, but tell them about the B-29. Our uncle went down in the B-29, lived. He lived, all right? He went down in the Caribbean in 44, training exercise. And, uh, he was a tail gunner. He was a slight man, so he could fit in the right. Put a tail gunner spot. And uh, I'm just hoping there's uh, something about the B-29 in there. Uh, I also read, oh, I read Guadalcanal Diary in high school. 
along with uh, they were expendable and uh, 30 seconds over Tokyo all that stuff I read in high school I was very interested in that it's interesting you mentioned 30 seconds over Tokyo you know that raid was kept so secret so while Random House had published Guadalcanal Diary they had in their safes at Random House that manuscript 30 seconds over Tokyo oh, yeah. but they were just waiting for the okay from the government to get it printed God is my co-pilot that's another good one <laughs> I read the ball in high school. Now, the B-29 was a, just a technical marvel, and they spent more money on developing that bomber than they did on the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb. And it was just a very complex plane to fly, and uh, it was just uh, amazing what uh, Kurt Daskus wrote about it. He produced a whole series of articles for the Saturday Evening Post about their progress as they went from the United States and flew to various spots to get finally to Guam uh, for their bombing missions. And he flew on five bombing missions uh, with the crew he accompanied. And from there he went to uh, an aircraft carrier, the USS Ticonderoga, that was uh, doing some missions against the actual uh, Japanese home islands and some Japanese naval bases at the end of the war. And once again flew in the combat on a uh, Avenger torpedo bomber and uh, was on a strike mission. And he got lucky again because he decided to stay on the ship for a couple of days and the pilot he flew with uh, went on another mission and on this mission something went wrong with the plane and it spiraled in and the crew that he had known got to know were killed in action. They were noted, to, the 29s were noted for the outside uh, right side engine went bad mm -hmm. and that's what happened to my uncle's plane. Yeah. Uh. And it happened to uh, Trigaskas and one of missions, he looked out and someone noticed, oh, the engine's on fire. That's it. Yeah, yeah. It was on the right side, too. The same yeah. engine broke. Wow. Yeah? yeah. Um, no, overnight. Did, did he um, comment about the differences in the battle, between the different type of um, warfare between World War II and Vietnam? He really didn't report on the differences. He always was someone who was on the side of the American soldier. So he wrote, uh, and once again, he found someone in Vietnam who he could connect with, who was a, you know, a real professional fighting man. And uh, he was very upset. He had gone home to write his book and learned that this man and some other people he had known and flew with on helicopter missions uh, in South Vietnam uh, had been killed in a, in a crash big upset for him. But he always was very um, impressed by the professionalism of the American fighting men. And I think uh, that was drew him time and time again into combat. And he didn't really report on the Korean War. He was dealing, he had switched to an insulin regime for his diabetes after the World War II ended. And he's having a little trouble getting his health in order. So by the time he decided to see if he could report from the Korean War, the armistice had been signed. But he did go over to Korea to do a propaganda film for the U.S. Information Agency. And he was tasked with going and interviewing troops from some of the smaller nations that contributed to U.N. effort, including like the Philippines, and even England, Australia, and, and those countries who had sent some contingent of soldiers to fight alongside U.S. troops in that war. And was very impressed by the troops he did meet from these smaller countries. He thought it was a, a great effort on their behalf because Countries like Greece knew the dangers of communism because they fought against uh, communism and, uh, and went and their troops went to Korea and did the same there as well. Very impressed by their bravery. I'm just, I was thinking, my brother served in <coughs> Vietnam for two enlistments um, beginning in uh, September of 1968. And like we were glued. We were not a family of television watchers. We had a television family um, compared to a lot of my peers, but one of the reasons we had a television was to watch Walter Cronkite report about the Vietnam War. It's quite different when he yeah. first went to Vietnam and people like Malcolm Brown, who I'm writing about next, who's the AP bureau chief at that time, in the early 1960s, there weren't hundreds of thousands of American forces in South Vietnam. We're talking about 10,000 to 12,000 American advisors 
uh, who had signed up for this. Uh, they weren't draftees, they were professional soldiers, a lot with experience in Korea and some in World War II as well. So it's quite a different war after you know, LBJ took over and escalated our involvement in the war. It's quite a different uh, scene uh, for reporters of that time and also for the Americans who were doing the, uh, advising the South Vietnamese in, in, the, in the war against the BC and the North Vietnamese soldiers. Um, and my brother um, unfortunately uh, passed away from the impact of the Asian in Orange. Orange right? But Ray, one of the last book he read was by you. And I uh, it was about the Marine reporter. Right, Bob Sherratt, Robert yes, Sherratt. Yes, yeah. right. This and that was the last book that my brother read. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was very well done. And he really appreciated it. And I wanted to tell you how much I, how, you know, I knew uh, when I listened to you, uh, when I had a chance to listen to you about that book, um, I asked you to sign it to my brother James. And I was so, I really enjoyed, we read it together, yeah. and that was just an amazing experience. And so I want to thank you for that, as well as so many other books that I have really enjoyed that you have written. And I have, I'm looking forward to being able to thank deep you. dive into this one. Thanks, thank you. you. Yeah, this is the third, this is my completion of my World War II Correspondent Trilogy, <laughs> uh, that I'm, I'm calling it. I had written previously about uh, Ernie Pott, of course, uh, who had, I had uh, gotten to know because I went to IU and studied journalism, took classes at Ernie Pyle Hall, and he was always a, a big person uh, to anyone involved in journalism at IU. And then I wrote the second, my second book about Bob Sherrod, who uh, was a reporter for Time and Life magazine. And really, as Janelle said, was the Ernie Pyle of the Marine Corps in the Pacific. He followed the Marines from Tarawa, wrote a best-selling book about that, uh, on to uh, Okinawa and Iwo Jima and the, the Central Pacific Drive with the Marines. And then Tregascus, I was looking, I thought, I should write you know, a third book, make it a trilogy. And then, <laughs> as I said, when I learned that uh, we shared the same birthday, I thought, well, you know, it seems fated <laughs> that I do this. So it was great to write. So tell them then, the, the book has a deadline in August, he's about finished with book number 19. It, uh, Malcolm's name came up in this research? Yes it did, uh, as uh, one of the young reporters that he uh, came into contact with when he was overseas uh, in Vietnam. And uh, I got to learn more about uh, Malcolm Brown, who was the head of the AP Bureau in Saigon in the early 1960s. And he's probably best known because if you think of the Vietnam War, there are certain photos that spring to mind. Uh, at the end of the war, there's a famous photo of the young girl who was uh, inadvertently you know, attacked by uh, a napalm bomb. She's running down the road crying naked uh, because of the bomb. There's a photo from the Tet Offensive where the South Vietnamese police chief shoots the suspected gorilla in the head, which was also caught on, on by a TV cameraman as well. And then early on in the war, one of the things that really uh, put Vietnam on the map as far as the American consciousness was a photo of the Buddhist monk who set himself on fire. And Malcolm Brown was the guy who took that photo. He was the only Western newsman there at that protest with a camera and the only one that captured on film. And uh, that really, I think, set the stage for uh, American involvement in the war and uh, put it on the front pages of the newspapers around the country. The war was 10 years too long. I mean, there, even in the early 1960s, you know, right before the coup that took down the Zien government, there are conversations in the Kennedy administration as well, you know, someone or might wish to get out, you know, just withdraw the troops. They were talking about it in 1963. The French couldn't beat them. What do you yeah. think we could do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anybody else? Thanks, everyone, well, for coming.